Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's uh, community webinar, 15 Commandments for Cassandra DBAs. Uh, very excited today. We are filming in front of a live studio audience. Patrick McFadden, our chief evangelist for Apache Cassandra here at Datastax, is actually live in Vancouver at NetApp. So very excited to have the NetApp folks with us. If you hear um, heckling, jeering, laughing, that is why. So a uh, little bit of uh, housekeeping. We welcome all questions. Please type your questions into the Q&A panel inside of WebEx. And at the end of the webinar, we will get through just as many of the questions as we have time for. So we have a, a very good crowd in attendance today, so should be lots of good Q&A going. So without further ado, I shall hand over to Mr. Patrick McFadden, 15 Commandments of Cassandra Admin. Okay, take it away, Patrick. All right, well, yeah, so we're not filming, actually. We, uh, we I don't have any cameras, but we are we have live audio from that. And Patrick, but, uh, please get a little closer to the phone microphone if you can. Okay, is that better? That is yeah, better. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> so, yeah, we're not filming. It's all audio. <laughs> Although if I was filming, you'd see a bunch of happy faces right now, right? So, uh, we are, we're going to talk about uh, 15 commands. Can we get a chair from this live studio, studio audience? Can we get a Cassandra chair? I don't believe anyone's there. Yay! All right, see, there you go. That's community like part. Are you sure you're not at the bar? It sounds like yeah, a <laughs> And all the king's men rejoice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we were just talking about we can't use Monty Python jokes anymore. They're too dated. So, um. <laughs> But I think it was still pretty funny. <laughs> all right, so, um, yeah, well, Rachel should be popping along here any, any minute now, and hopefully um, I'll see her. And I hopefully have control. I do. Okay. So uh, I, I have to. Uh, I'm going to do your housekeeping too. Uh, so February 13th, we have uh, Beyond Modify, uh, Read, Modify, and Write. I believe that is Al Toby. That's you are do that. on the. Uh, you are on the wrong slide deck. If you click on the tab that says 15 Commandments, you are actually doing the housekeeping at the end of the session. Well, I can't see all. <laughs> You know, this is why I you say are, we get You are at a pub. Don't, don't deny it. I don't see anything. Ah, I see it. All right. There you go. There you go. Now Did you're I, in the zone. In a pub. I, I lied. I'm not in Vancouver. I'm in Dublin. <laughs> oh, yeah. These guys are impressed now. All right. So <laughs> my live studio obviously doesn't have to heckle me. All right. So we started out with 15. 15 commandments. And we didn't drop it. So that's a Mel, Mel Brooks joke. But we couldn't stop at Ten Commandments. There's just too many things to talk about. So what we're going to go through is some hard, fast rules for Cassandra Admin. I think anybody who does Cassandra Admin will probably know a few of these, and maybe some will be new. If they're new, great. Um, if you have questions about any of these, go ahead and pop them in, because I'm going to have to run through these fairly quickly to get to 15 and have some time for questions at the end of the hour. But, of course, this will all get published out in a blog post. I'll, I'll have this out um, in no time at all so we can have a discussion area for it as well. But uh, these are hard rules that, um, because I'm as old as Moses uh, with Cassandra, I've learned over the years. Um, Rachel and I both have done a lot of consulting work and have done this for a long time, seeing all the bad things that can happen. Just let my pain be your guide. Um, so let's start out with the first one. So commandment number one. Great data model. Start with the queries. Now, as you know, the the whole tenet of data modeling with Cassandra is start with your queries. But really, think about what your application is trying to accomplish. If I uh, if I hear someone say, "How do I copy my my relational database into a Cassandra database?" I get a little sad because that means that you're not thinking about how Cassandra does data modeling. You're thinking about how relational data models work. So you're going to start with queries, and that's that's because 
Cassandra is an application database. Um, and when you try to do, a, say, a join or you have uh, denormalized where you're doing three or four joins in memory, that can get pretty painful fast. So this is, uh, of course, I get to plug my, my webinars a bit, but I do a lot of talking about data modeling, and that's what I start with. Here's your application. So commandment number two, uh, it's okay to duplicate data. Now, along the line of the first question, or the first commandment where you start with your queries, when you're running with queries, sometimes those queries are not going to manage uh, exactly what you want for the data set that you're talking about. So you have to duplicate data, and that's perfectly fine. If you have to write data into three or four or even ten column families or tables at the same time when, you're, when your application is ingesting data, just so you can manage your queries, no problem. Cassandra takes writes like a scalded dog. That's pretty fast. And that's not going to be your problem. And what you're trying to do is optimize your reads at right time. So when you insert your data, it should be ready to go for that query that's coming along. If you're looking for those sub-millisecond reads... Go to the phone microphone again. Uh, a little closer. <laughs> All right. See, if I lean back, that's bad, isn't it? That's All right, so All right, I'm just going to lay on top of this thing. It's kind of awkward. Good thing we're not filming this. So uh, we have plenty of, of cases where duplicating data is a good idea. An example would be like with log data. You may need to spin your log data into several views. And think about you know, Cassandra column family like a materialized view. So the materialized view is going to be perfect for when you want to grab that data at the time you want to grab it. And um, that means you're going to have to have a lot more data in there. I, you know, and if you're worried about the size of your data, uh, keep in mind that Cassandra also does compression by default, so it does keep it pretty manageable. All right, number two, or three, sorry, three. Commandment number three, disk I.O. is your first problem to solve. I've said it 100,000 times, and I'm going to say it one more time, is that um, we have run into some serious problems as consultants, and I'll tell you, most times that this has happened, uh, that I've seen like a crater with an install, is it came down to disk I.O. For instance, using something like NFS, which, sorry NetApp guys, I know I'm, uh, you guys sell an NFS, but you know that's not the right solution for Cassandra. Um, and there are different disk solutions for that. NFS is great for a lot of things, not for Cassandra. The reason being is that Cassandra's disk I.O. is different from, say, a lot of other databases. It uses a lot of sequential I.O. And there's not random writes on the database. So IOPS, you know, you hear people talk about IOPS. IOPS are irrelevant. It's all about latency and throughput. And the latency is really what it comes down to because <clears throat> if you want to get multi or sub millisecond uh, queries, then what you're, you really have to solve that at the disk first. If you can't get data off the disk within 20 milliseconds, then how are you possibly thinking you're going to get that off the disk or how you're going to get that query back in less than 20 milliseconds on your P95? So um, I, I said something pretty inflammatory on Twitter, which was great. I said I'm pretty much done with SATA, 7200 drive, 7200 RPM drives. I just don't think that's a good fit for Cassandra. Um, SAS is a perfectly acceptable model for how to, uh, how to run disk. And of course, SSDs eliminate the problem completely. But um, this is your first problem to solve. All right, commandment number four. Secondary indexes are for convenience, not speed. The uh, usage of secondary indexes uh, can be pretty prolific whenever you come from a relational background because you think, oh, it's an index, it's going to be fast. Indexes in relational databases are indeed the speed, that's how you get speed in a relational database. The word index is unfortunate in Cassandra because that's not what it's doing. What you're doing is you're allowing the query to find data in columns and across the cluster. So what secondary indexes will do is create a distributed, uh, a distributed search. And so each node has a, say, an index for all the column data. So if you say index, uh, like a first name field, uh, then it's got, each node will have a first name field on it. Those secondary indexes will help you find data inside that um, without having to do some your own indexing. But it, if you have a thousand nodes and you're having to do a distributed search, that, that can add up. So yes, it's very convenient, but whenever you need speed, that's not going to help you. 
and I work with a lot of people that um, have used way too many secondary indexes and have gotten into a performance problem. So what we do usually is just take those secondary indexes and turn them into more of a, like a column family index where we build our own indexes. Most times they're not that complicated, it's just a different way of thinking. All right, so commandment number five, embrace large partitions and denormalization. And denormalization is a good term if you're coming from a relational database. Relational databases use normal forms, third, fourth, fifth, if you're that cool. But when you denormalize your data in a relational database, you're pulling those normal forms together. So that means if you had, say, a user table, a department table, and then you join those um, at query time, that, that's using the normal forms. If you put the user with the department in the same table, that's denormalized. Well, with Cassandra, you do want to put all that data co-located if you want a fast query. And those large partitions would be mean, meaning you use more than one clustering column in your uh, primary key definition, and that's a CQL topic. But what you're doing is you're optimizing for the storage model. So going back to I.O., the storage model is going to be a sequential read from disk. If you keep really short partitions in your table, then what you're doing is essentially making it so you have to do a lot of row grabs. And so rows, each row is going to be on a different server, so it's going to have to do a distributed search on that as well. So large partitions are a great way to build indexes as well because it, a slice query can be indexed. So all of these things point towards this large partition um, with that denormalization technique. Uh, and if you want an example of that, um, just Google my, my weather station example. Um, I, I go through, like this, I believe it's the uh, third example that I go through, I talk about how to partition your data so that it is large and, and a fast query. So when you slice, say, weather data over a certain amount of time, you'll get uh, a very fast query out of that <clears throat> instead of just putting it like a key value store, which is not the most efficient. All right, so uh, commandment number six, don't be afraid to add nodes. I've sadly seen too many people try to vertically scale the nodes that they have when it would probably be easier just to add a couple of nodes. Cassandra is a linear scaling system. You should feel that, like that's the solution instead of having to you know, try to add more memory or more CPU or more disk to the existing nodes that you have. Sometimes that can be perfectly viable. Um, you know, for instance, if you're in Amazon, it's pretty easy to swap out an M1X large 404XL if you have your operations topic set right. But, and a lot of times, you know, even with Amazon, there's, there is a cut point where it's add a couple more nodes and you should be fine. Um, so in, the, in relation to, you know, how Cassandra works, I also, and this is kind of like a sub-commandment to this, is be ready to add nodes. Do not wait until you have a performance problem because you don't have enough capacity to try to figure out how to add more nodes into your system. And that's just an operations topic. It should not take you a week to figure out how you're going to get a new machine or how you're going to set it up or install the operating system. Uh, be ready. And if you've come from a background where uh, you performance, part of your job is performance analysis and make sure you have enough capacity, this can be really helpful. Um, I, I spent a lot of time in previous career, previous life, figuring out how much load I'm going to put onto a server and then pre-buying the server to fit it. And then just to find out that sometimes I wasn't on the money and we had to quickly buy a new server. Man, I really wish I had the ability to add nodes. Commandment number seven. You're doing pretty good on time, too. Mind your compaction. Compaction is, I, I don't want to say it's dark art, but a lot of people don't understand compaction. And it is the most, uh, I think it's one of the most impactful things that can happen on a Cassandra node if not managed properly. And it is because with any disk, uh, disk-oriented database, there will be I.O. And with compaction, you're just deferring that I.O. until the end of the process. So just as a just as a quick primer on that, it's your your initial I.O. into a Cassandra node is very light. 
because whenever you add data to a Cassandra node, that single mutation, the row key with a column, gets put into the commit log first, which is an append-only log, and then it gets put into the memory table, mem table, and then the acknowledgement sends back to the, to the client. Very quick, very IO uh, light. Uh, that append-only log and commit is really where all that happens. Later, after that mem table is full, or I'm sorry, the JVM flushes, this is I have a certain amount of memory that I need to get back, it will flush that mem table. <clears throat> that is a sequential write to the disk, and that is a pretty efficient operation. It can be a little heavy, but once that SS table is written to disk, it's mutable. So compaction is where we really have to make up the difference. So if you're updating a lot of data, you have a lot of tombstones. I'm looking at the NetApp guys. What's up? <laughs> uh, so, see, I got to heckle them. Um, if you have tombstones, all that has to get dealt with during compaction. Compaction is a large sequential read with a large sequential write. And it's mems, the mem table is, is merged, sorted in memory, and sent out to the disk again. So, those compactions, if they're not keeping up, if you're falling behind or you're completely obliterating all the disk I.O. that you have with compaction, it will impact your system poorly. If you fall behind on compaction, it will make the statistics in, say, Bloom filters and your uh, key cache fall behind, and you'll have more seeks to find your data. So this all kind of fits into this, hey, my performance is kind of hinging around compaction. It's something you really have to keep track of. Now, if you use Op Center, there is pending compactions that shows how many pending compactions there are on a graph. That should look like a nice sawtooth or a, a very small size wave. If it's going up and to the right, like you wish your stock prices were going, that's bad because that means you're never keeping up with your compactions. Obvious thing to look for is what, how, what, what's going on in the disk. Um, another thing to consider too, and I know I'm kind of going on about compactions, but I really feel like this is a big deal and I was talking to somebody about this this morning, is if you have a lot of hardware, don't be afraid to unthrottle those compactions. And that's actually, a, that's, that's one thing I see a lot, where, hey, you know, we got these uh, crazy good servers with SSDs, and man, our compactions just can't keep up. Well, I look and see that, you know, there's default throttling to 16 megs a second, and so you'll see a nice flat line of, of throughput, and the disk is bored. Let it go and unthrottle those compactions and see how it goes if you have enough I.O. And that, that's, I think that's kind of a, a, a pretty common pattern as we get into better disks now is that those compactions, if they want to run 40 megs, 50 megs a second for a few minutes, it's great. It's not going to impact your system, but it's keeping up pretty well. If you have a few, if you have a few terabytes of data and you're doing uh, tens and thousands of writes per second on a single node, that's going to help a lot. It'll look very healthy. So that's enough about compactions for now. Commandment number eight. Well, I gotta quickly re remember all my <clears throat> Roman numerals. Um, never use shared storage. Seems like we're talking a lot about disk IO. The shared storage. I know there's NetApp guys. Yeah, it's all good. You guys don't share all. Of <laughs> Boy, wrong place to be talking about this. <laughs> e series. <laughs> all right. So um, never use shared storage. I'm gonna. What's that? I said start throwing things at you. Yeah, they are. Yeah, I'm, I'm ducking here. They have these really, really nice NetApp mugs that are hard as hell. <laughs> yeah, um, luckily I'm quick. So <laughs> NFS, I talked about that earlier. Shared storage is great for a lot of things. Cassandra being a distributed system, expects everything to be distributed in more or less. I mean, that's the way it was optimized. And uh, if you think about what's running in Amazon, for instance, an ephemeral disk means it's local. You get a bunch of those, and that, that's a single point, right? If you're using a shared storage medium, first things first, uh, one of my favorite things is, oh, you don't have a single point of failure? Let me create one for you. So if you're putting everything to one fat array, and you have, let's say, 50 Cassandra nodes going into one array, that array goes down, your cluster's offline. Um, granted, that doesn't happen a lot. Now, the other thing that I feel is more, uh, probably less obvious, and have, I have seen time and time again, is that with a lot of sequential disk I.O., sequential reads, sequential writes, I've seen some really nice arrays get burned up pretty fast. 
they're just not optimized for that workload. They're optimized for random workloads, IOPS, and how fast you can get IOPS through the pipe. When you're using shared storage in that, in that way, you can fall behind in your compactions really quick because you're only getting, and I've seen this so many times, you're not even getting close to a couple, maybe three megabytes per second of compaction. You're never going to win the war with that. So it's, it's just not a good idea. And not to mention, it could be pretty expensive. Putting local disk on a machine and just buying a bunch of machines is a lot cheaper than buying a big array. And it's just the way that this works. Um, I, and I have not seen in any case where that has been an exception. Um, this has always been the rule. This is probably my favorite commandment. I'm going to bookmark that. Commandment number eight. What's up? Okay. Thank God this is not another shared storage one. I don't have to duck. Okay, so commandment number nine, understand cache. That means disk, key, and row. Those are your three caches that you have to understand. And one, I, there's, there's plenty of misconception, but also plenty of benefit. So when you add, say, a lot of memory to a Cassandra node, let's say more than what you have in your heap, I've heard people say this, I only have an eight gig heap. Why do I need to have a lot of memory in my machine? Well, there's a few, few reasons. One reason is we're, we're moving more things off heap every single rev of, of Cassandra. Let's just put that aside. Let's say you're not using any off heap cache or off heap storage. The disk cache is probably your best friend because the way Cassandra writes files, they are immutable. And when you write immutable files, they're so ready to be cached by the OS cache, disk cache. That means if you read that data from the disk, it's, it's going to just stick in memory. There's no random I.O. that will create dirty page cache hits. And so you're going to have a lot of performance right there. So let's say one of my favorite numbers, 128 gigs of RAM for a Cassandra node, means that you could put a lot of, of actual data on that, that node that will probably be served up right out of memory. And it's not an in-memory database, it's just heavily cached. When I look at uh, 95th percentiles on latencies that are below one millisecond, I can almost always point to the fact that it's probably heavily cached on, in a, the OS row or an OS cache. Now, key cache is uh, yet another great tool in your arsenal when you're trying to fight latencies. Key cache is just, here's a row key, uh, or I'm sorry, here's an SS table with row key. I want to find the SS table and the, using that row key. Because the faster I find the actual data on disk, the less seeks I have to do. And when I have to do less seeks, then those can multiply. If you're using a uh, slower disk and it takes a few milliseconds to do a seek, and you have to do five to find your data, you know, that adds up, right? <clears throat> it's like anything. And if you have a, a very efficient one seek for that row of data, then you're in good shape with how your latencies are. You're just chasing that one seek time on your average seek time on your disk. So like with really even bad SATA disks, you know, you're talking anywhere from five to 12 milliseconds of, of latency. Okay, well, if you had to do that five times, that would really suck. But one time, it's not so bad. So the row cache is gonna help you get to that SS table faster. Uh, I'm sorry, key cache. The row cache <laughs> is the one that everyone wants to be a query cache, but is not. So just as a heads up, if you go on to the Apache JIRA, you'll see that there is a query cache JIRA that will more or less replace what row cache is doing. Most times, row cache does not do what you expect it to do, and I've seen some pretty bad effects about it. Um, it's great for um, very small partitions of data, short rows, that are accessed frequently, not updated frequently. And th those are pretty limited use cases. It's not just something you throw on there and you get magic performance. Um, it's, it's not like a query cache. But a query, quest, query cache is coming. So soon I will have a fourth item on commandment number nine. Commandment number 10, I just mentioned it. Always use JNA, the part that I mentioned was off heap. Off heap means that so the JVM, the Java Virtual Machine, has a certain amount of memory that's allocated for its own storage. and so. Uh, if you weren't using any method to get outside of the, the JVM, every bit of memory, the cache, everything, has to be stored in the Java heap. 
Java Heap has a problem sometimes called garbage collection. And garbage collection can turn into a problem because if it gets behind or it has to stop everything, it will halt the world. It's called Stop the World GC. We want to try to keep the, the Java virtual machine happy by maintaining a really, uh, uh, keeping the heat manageable. And one of the ways that we do this, and this is not just the Cassandra project, it's a lot of uh, JVM oriented servers are now moving things off heap, meaning that you're just using main memory instead of having to go uh, directly into the Java heap. So JNA is what helps us do that. JNA is, is the enabler for that and also gives us some other hooks into the operating system, but it really is key. And if you want to have a chance at good performance, make sure you're running JNA. Now, if you're using the Datastax version of Cassandra, you're covered. If you download the tarball from the Apache website, you have to, of course, bring that in yourself. Um, but the matter of using JNA is such a big deal that um, there's actually a JIRA in the 2.1 trunk that says we won't start unless you're using JNA because there's so much dependent on JNA anymore that you have to have it. Um, it's, just, it's just almost a no-brainer. So you, JNA. Commandment number 11, learn how to load data. That's and I'm going to take it from the largest to the smallest, uh, bulk load, insert, copy. Now, when we talk about loading data, I, I, I went back, I'll talk about a little bit how people look at relational databases, it's like, how can I copy my data? Again, bad idea, because you're taking a relational tables and you're trying to create Cassandra tables out of it. You don't want to do that. Um, you want to rebuild your data model. Um, so if we have, uh, we have a lot of data that needs to get into the system in a certain format, how do we do that? Bulk load is the fastest large-scale large, large scale way to move gigabytes, terabytes of data into a Cassandra node. The bulk loader itself is uh, it's SS table loader. The trick is that you have to create SS tables and then use those to load in. Now that sounds pretty nutty, like what, what do I look like? Uh, Cassandra programmer, it's actually not that bad. There's some helper classes that can help you get those into, uh, create an SS table. I have code on my GitHub account on how to do it. It's just a few lines of code. And essentially what you're doing is you're creating um, the, the actual SS table file um, programmatically and then using that to, bulk, to push that into your cluster. So think about like if you did a MapReduce job, I've seen this where the reducer actually creates SS tables and then you bulk load that data into a Cassandra node. That's one way to do it. Now, the, the next one down is insert, and that's just standard CQL inserts, and this is a custom loader. Um, I saw a blog post about that just recently. <laughs> Building a custom loader is not a bad idea um, because you're, what you're doing is you're taking your data model, the one you wanted, um, and you're programmatically applying that to this load process. And you can do some neat tricks. You can do parallel loads um, if you use our Java driver. Uh, you can use threads. So it can be a lot faster. The, the one, the last one on that list, which is not least, is the copy command. And that's good for, I'd say, millions of rows, uh, not much more. You wouldn't load terabytes of data with the copy command. It's just not built for that. And it is, built, it is a convenience command that's built in the CQL shell. But it's just not um, not the heavy duty loader like bulk load would be. Bulk, bulk load is like that's like the big gun. All right. Commandment number twelve. I'm doing good on time. Repair is not isn't just for broken data. So repair uh, again is one of those. There's, there's some gray area that I want to try to clear up. So I, I hear that a lot. Well, I, I, my my data is fine. I don't need to repair it. I don't need to run repair. Repair is actually just part of what it originally was. If you go back to the Dynamo paper, it was anti-entropy repair. And the whole point of repair was, hey, things happen in a large distributed system. You don't know what's up. If you have a thousand machines in your cluster, it, chances are one of them is not gonna be very nice. And it's, we'll just accept the fact that bad things happen to good clusters. So um, repair is, the anti-entropy repair means you're just checking for consistency in your data continuously. Now there are mechanisms on read, for instance, like if you do a read of one, it will do a read repair. If you do a read with quorum, it will find bad data and fix that as well. But a repair operation can run continuously in your cluster, and it should. With uh, the DataStacks version of Op Center, um, 
the latest version. If you're on the enterprise uh, license, then it has a what's called a repair expert, uh, repair service that will run continuously in your in your cluster, just 24/7 runs repair. And why? Because we try to get ahead of any bad things that are happening in your cluster. It's just a good idea. It's a consistency check, and uh, you know it doesn't mean your your database is down or you're missing data. It's just a good idea to make sure that everything is consistent. Um, and so that, I mean, that repair is uh, being pretty heavily worked on in the latest versions of Cassandra to make it more efficient, faster. So hopefully, I think that the uh, gray area will turn a little more clear. Commandment number 13, know the relationship between consistency level and replication factor. Now, this could either be an operations topic or a data modeling slash programming topic, maybe both, because I've seen this where uh, replication factor and consistency levels weren't really used in conjunction very well. Um, give you an example. I've seen people do an, a replication factor of two and use quorum. That doesn't make any sense because it, essentially you're asking for 51% of the nodes to be consistent or you have a consistent response. Um, when you ask for a consistency level quorum on two, they're either both up or you're down. There's no, there's no gray area. Having a replication factor of three means you can have one offline and still satisfy quorum. That's more what you probably want. Now, if you also knowing that if you expand your replication factor to say 10, that I've seen that in production, and you do quorum, you're waiting for a lot of machines to respond to you. And that can affect your, your speeds. Now, I don't know if you're that paranoid about your data. I've seen it. Ten, a replication factor of 10 is pretty intense. But when can a replication factor of 10 be good? When you're using a consistency level of 1, because you have a much higher chance of getting a local read on that data. So understanding, okay, this is the differences, and these are the trade-offs, and oh, wait a minute, here's the benefits, and that's what I want you to understand is the benefit. Um, you can you can make some really sound architectural decisions based on those two things. So don't uh, don't just walk into it and say oh, I'm just going to use RF3 and, and Quorum forever. Think about how it is with your application. Maybe you don't need that, and maybe maybe a replication factor of two is fine, and you do a one. That may that that could be fine too. So it becomes you know a use case issue, but just understand those differences. Re All right, so replication factor 14. How about commandment 14? Ugh, I got RF on the brain. So commandment number 14, more than 8 gig of JVM heap doesn't mean better performance. Um, going back to our JNA discussion off heap, I yeah, I've, I've seen this before. I've, I've seen 24 gig heaps in production. Now, why is that a problem? It's not a problem until it is, and when it's a problem, it really is bad. Because 24 gigs of heap, if you know anything about JVM or you've been burned by garbage collection, you know that 24 gigs of heap can take forever to collect if you have a problem with your JVM. So garbage collection, of course, is whenever it picks up unused objects and tries to clean out the JVM heap. If you have 24 gigs of that, you could wind up having a stop the world GC for minutes. And it's just not a good idea. It doesn't mean there's any better performance either. If you're using JNA, most of the performance aspects are going to be pulled out of the JVM anyway. Ideally, I think I think the goal really is to get our JVM heap as small as we can because that's going to be the biggest pain point. JVM pauses, that's going to be your bigger problem to solve. And like if you're trying to get low latency consistency in your performance in a, in a Cassandra cluster, smaller heaps are good. Now, inside the heap, um, it's not a bad idea to understand the little, the little more intricacies, like uh, the new size versus old gen. Like, what, what are you trying to accomplish in your data model? Out of the scope for this particular commandment, but definitely one worth asking. There was a great article uh, by the guys at Shift, Blake Eggleston, uh, John Haddad, did a great um, blog post just last week. I think it was the week before. Thanks, guys, if you're on uh, for. Uh, tuning JVM heap for a data model, and it, it was kind of counter to what you would expect. They um, increased their new size, which you think, wow, that's going to be you know a par new G, uh, garbage collection, and it's going to be bad. 
but it matched their data model. Very interesting way to do things. Um, but I, uh, I kind of went down the JVM rat hole there, but um, don't use more than eight gig. It really isn't a good idea. And if you have, if you think you need to, then let us know. We're always here to help. And finally, commandment number 15, get involved in the community. Okay, this is a personal plug, but um, <laughs> I was telling one of the guys here, it's like, hey, well, you guys should do a meetup and talk about your experiences. This is the community. Datastax doesn't own Cassandra. We're just part of the community, too. We do a lot of work here, and it's great. But if you look at the committer list, there's a lot of people in the, uh, the company. There's a huge commitment to the community here. That's what I do. I love working with people who are using Cassandra, whether they're customers or not, or they're just out there using the open source version. And because the community is where things happen, you look at uh, blog posts, people tweeting, uh, IRC, the mailing list, meetups. Get involved. Go to a meetup. Maybe hold a meetup. If, you, if you're um, doing some really interesting stuff, brag about it. And it's really cool. I, I, I love hearing about some innovative stuff, like this like that JVM tuning uh, blog post a couple weeks ago from Shift, that, that, that would have never came out of my mouth. That, I would have never thought of that. But it's real world. I want to hear what you're doing and, and tell the community what you're doing. Because I'll tell you, there's probably somebody else that is in your boat and wants to hear about it. And that's, this is the best part of open source, is community. So get involved. And if you need help getting involved or you have some questions, let me know. You guys know where I'm at. I'm on Twitter all the time. So. Uh, hit me up, and I'll, I'll point you in the right direction if I can. So I have uh, no more questions, no more commandments to give forth. <laughs> so um, hey, I think Patrick, we're ready. Do you have a slide that um, summarizes the 15 commandments by any chance? Um, no. That's a great idea. <laughs> that, is, that is one of the questions someone's asking. So. Uh, what, I'll kick out a blog post. I'll kick out a blog post. We could actually even produce a poster of the 15 commandments. Might might be very nice. Um, but that is that is something that is being asked asked for um, here in in the Q and A panel. Yeah. Well, or um, maybe some big tablets, and I can carry them around. That'd be great swag. So uh, thank you, Moses McFadden. Um, <laughs> All right. Reminder, what do we got? We will now switch to the question and answer uh, part of the webinar. Um, please type your questions in the Q and A panel. Um, some of you are using the chat. We can get there, but it's easier if you use the Q and A panel. So, uh, Patrick, are, are you ready, sir? Bring it. I'm ready. Um, so Nikhil is asking, could you elaborate on what you mean by key cache? All right, um, that's the cache for the key. No, <laughs> that's a flippant answer. Um, key cache, so when you have a row key, of, and a row key is how we store the data, and then it's all the columns associated with that row key, that row key points to an SS table on disk, so, or even a node. Eventually, you know, it will show up in an SS table. The key cache is um, is in memory. So whenever we do, when we flush an SS table to disk, we update the index, and that key, that row key, um, hopefully is in the key cache. And then when you ask for that row key, it should say, "This is exactly the SS table it's sitting on." If it's a cache miss, then you have to, you're relying on Bloom filters to find that, and that can mean that you have more seeks on disk. So it's very simple, uh, but very powerful whenever you're trying to get low latency reads. Okay, thank you. Pavan is asking, great tips. Could you please explain about node tool upgrade SS tables? Also, if any MapReduce job is started during upgrade SS table process, will it have any impact on the data. So upgrade SS tables, really all it's doing is rewriting all of your SS tables and 
if it's a format change, it will change that. Um, so for instance, whenever we go from a version that requires it, you're just rewriting the storage engine and updating all the indexes for that. So it is, um, it's like compaction light, I guess you could say. It takes an SS table in and kicks another one out. And that's, that's all it's meant to do. Um, now, the question was, if running upgrade SS tables while you're trying to upgrade the node, was that what he asked? Yes, exactly. And if this is the Pavan I think it is, I'm going to get you for that. Um, <laughs> so uh, the doing an upgrade SS table and trying to upgrade your node is not recommended at all because what you're doing is you're rewriting your SS tables for a certain format. So if there's a format change in that upgrade process, then you're going to have – no, don't do that. Um, let it finish. Yeah, it could take a while. If you have a lot of data on your node, it's going to have to rewrite all the SS tables on your node. Be prepared. Okay, great. Um, so, Patrick, Dimitri, a um, little bit of a statement and a question here. So, he took a, a data stacks training class. Uh, they were using the same data, and it was bulk uploaded into um, – uh, Microsoft SQL Server, Postgres, and Cassandra, and here's the kicker, on Windows. Mm. Um, Cassandra was slower every time. Uh, the instructor was looking at the configuration but couldn't make it any faster. Any thoughts on that, Patrick? Um, and and maybe, maybe Windows here is the issue. <laughs> Did you reboot it? Oh, no. <laughs> That's an easy one. Um, no, I, I think that what I've always seen is a, uh, a problem on Windows that can be managed is memory, um, it, because Windows manages memory differently. And if you have, uh, say, your your page cache, uh, which is paging out on disk, if you're using a lot of that, essentially what you're doing is you're turning a high I.O. operation into a higher I.O. operation, um, and it's non-random. It's sequential. So as as you're filling up your memory and it's paging out to disk, you're also dumping data on the disk. Uh, and that's, prob I, would, I would say, it's probably an issue of just how much memory was available to the JVM as well. Um, I, I'm speculating because I don't know exactly what you had going on, but it's, I would guess that you're, you just didn't have enough memory to work with. And there's tweaking we could do on that. Um, also, the commit log, we can, we can play around with, like, batch instead of having <laughs> Um, there are ways to make it faster, but so the uh, data stacks engineering team um, is uh, uh, staffing up pretty heavily on on Windows experience. So um, you know, look look out for some improvements coming in the future there. Yeah, yeah, that that is definitely true. Um, Windows is not a uh, is not a forgotten OS at all. Um, it has its own challenges in all seriousness that we can manage. So we're going to do that. Okay, Suman asks, how about memory requirements for the Bloom filter? Any commandments? Commandments for the Bloom filter. It used to be the Bloom filter was one of the heavier data structures to manage in, in your JVM. Um, it was uh, not too long ago. Uh, 1.1 that bloom filters were stored in heap and when you had JVM problems garbage collection that was more than likely it because for every so 600 terabyte of data you would have two gigs of usage in the heap and that's just a lot of data sitting in the heap if you have eight gigs and two of it's taken up by just bloom filters now that it's off heap it's not as big of a problem so it's, by and large you're going to be fine with the defaults now, in the cases where there's specialty modeling where you just really don't care about that, um, bloom filters, you can tune that way down. You can tune it way up as well. Bloom filters are that thing that get hit right after the, the row cache misses. The bloom filter steps in to help you find the SS table. If you have 1,000 SS, SS tables, how many S's am I going to put in that? If you have 1,000 SS tables, bloom filter will help you eliminate the majority of them so you can find the, the data on your on your disk um, instead of having to scan every thousand files. So the tuning portion of that is really just making sure that that's rock solid. Um, if you're using 1.2 and then eventually 2.0, um, 
Um, these will be, I, I wouldn't say there's a lot of tuning to do with bloom filters right now. And uh, um, if you have a special problem, of course, you can let us know. But um, just rest assured that, that tuning bloom filters post 1.1 is just not as big of an issue. Okay, thank you. And, and another uh, added commandment, maybe, for your second iteration. What about commandments related to V nodes, virtual nodes? <laughs> okay, a commandment. Um, I think the current guidance and commandment would be just create your data center from scratch with that. Don't don't try to convert an existing non V node cluster. Here, I'll come up with it. Thou shalt not convert an existing non V node cluster to a V node cluster. Create another data center with V nodes and. That's a lot faster way to do things. Excellent. I'm going to have a lot of chiseling. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good one, I think. Um, Wes is asking, Mr. McFadden, what are your thoughts on running Cassandra on a VM, on VMware? Is it appropriate? Is it appropriate? That is a loaded question. Um, it's funny because Here's, a, here's an answer that will make you think. Most successful Cassandra implementations are running on a virtual machine. Why? Well, that's what they're mostly in Amazon. I'd say a majority of, of Cassandra is running in Amazon. Now, how do they do? Why is it successful there? The key is not so much VMware or Zen or QEMU or whatever you're using. It's how are you managing your storage? And that, I think that comes down to, like, that's the bottom line. Um, if you're using VMware with NFS back disk, don't expect any performance. Um, if you're using VMware with local disk, you have a better chance. Um, the same with OpenStack. OpenStack has, you know, on Cinder, you can set up local disk. We found great success with that. And that's how they do it in Amazon. Ephemeral disks are local disks, and you get better performance there. Uh, a couple of things I've seen in VMware that was funny is that if you have it set up with the management tool, so it'll um, automatically migrate instances that are running at a high CPU. That's kind of fun, watching Cassandra nodes pop all around your VM or your VMware installation. Um, and I've also seen where if you were running like high resource load, which a Cassandra node is going to use a lot of resources, it's going to use a lot of disk memory, that sort of thing, um, it will shut it down. I've seen that twice. Where it's, all of a sudden, the cluster just started shutting down because VMware was turning it off. So just mind your VMware cluster. Make sure you're not, you don't put any bad settings on it. Uh, but performance on disk, manage that. Anil asks, a write writes to commit logs and then mem table. Does it mean that the commit log is on disk? Yes. It is on disk. That is a durable write. And the commit log is a sequential write. So it uh, is an append-only log. That's why it's so fast. We recommend if you're using spinning disk that you put your commit log on a different partition, like its own spindle, so that the disk head does not have to move. Thinking about your insert performance, if the disk head has to move, that's going to impact your commit time, right? So we want to have it on its own spindle so that when you do an append into that log, it's just moving the head across the disk really slowly so that you don't have a lot of latency. But yes, that is a durable right. Um, hey, and Paul is asking, uh, he'd like the link for the JVM tuning for data modeling, please. That, uh, we, can, uh, we can put it in the chat window. What, what was the title of that, uh, that one? Uh, it's on Planet Cassandra. <laughs> um, is it a data I don't, model on fire? No, 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 that was me. Uh, no, it's a... Uh, it was from a couple weeks ago. It was the JVM tuning from Shift, and I can't remember. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The architecture. It was the architecture one. Thank you, uh, studio audience member Alvin. Says uh, Cassandra tuning the JVM for ready read heavy workloads. Is that Kevin? No, that was Alvin that said that. Oh, because Kevin already posted it in the uh, in the window. What a responsive, what a helpful crowd we have on hand today. This That's is what, community. what community is all about. That was Commandment 15. Already, bam, that happened. <laughs> I'm going to tear up. I'm all right. So, moving on. <laughs> um, so, uh, so uh, 
Uh, Ryan is asking, do short TTLs, time to lives, also have an effect on GC and HEAP? No, because TTLs are more of a, uh, have more effect on your disk usage. The, you're still writing, there's nothing in a TTL that says how long it lives inside the memory. Um, and if, for those of you who don't know a TTL, that's time to live. That's whenever you put a, a second value, uh, a value in seconds on a column that says how long you want that data to exist. It's a very efficient way to delete data, say, like, if you only want it to exist for 30 days. Or what I'm expecting Ryan is probably doing is, uh, you know, maybe 30 seconds, you know. So what does that mean? That data still has to exist in memory, and then when it gets flushed out to disk, those TTLs will turn into tombstones on compaction. But it has nothing to do with garbage collection in the JVM or the heap size. Okay, great. Um, Mansi asks, and, and I, am, I am modifying his question, when shalt thy not useth key cache? Uh, wow. Not... I guess if you're constrained by a, how much JVM heap or how much memory you have, period, um, key cache is outside of, of JVM heap. Um, I, it's really it's a no-brainer to leave it on. I, I don't really have a good situation where you turn it off um, unless you were just looking to, to ballast out a bunch of memory uh, in general and you weren't really worried about latency. That might be an ex like an extreme Cassandra installation where you just want tons and tons and tons and tons of data and you don't care how slow it is, but you also have no memory on the box. Not a really ideal situation, so I'd say just leave it. Okay, thank you. Um, we have eight minutes left, Mr. Patrick. Loads of questions coming in here. David asks, what are the limits of secondary indexes? What is the most you would want to have for a given table? The limit. Uh, my personal preference is zero, um, but that's because I'm kind of a purist when it comes to secondary indexes. I like fast queries, and I build my own indexes on column families. Um, what is the limit? I don't know a hard upward limit, but uh, keep in mind that the more indexes you have, the more re-indexing that has to happen. So if you load a lot of data in there, you're doing a lot of compactions, all that data has to get re-indexed. So all this is going to start impacting, and it's really going to be how many rows you have of data and how many nodes. There's no hard rule for that. Um, but if you do, if you do have um, really unique data, you know that that could be helpful. If you have very non-unique data, say like um, you know first name, well, that's not very non-unique. Um, anyhow, if you if you're getting into these anti-patterns. That, that's a limit in my book. You're just not going to get any performance out of it. Thank you. Uh, Paresh asks or says and then asks, I am a newbie to Cassandra. Welcome, Paresh. We are glad to have you in the Cassandra community. Can you just quickly um, talk about what role a Bloom filter plays and if there are any resources that Paresh should uh, you know, use to, to get up to speed would be great. And other newbies, no doubt. No doubt. Um, Bloom filters, I, I, I just talked a little bit about Bloom filters, but just to kind of wrap that particular topic up, Bloom filters are a probabilistic data structure. So it's um, not like a blooming flower. Bloom was the guy. He was, a, he was a computer scientist who came up with this algorithm. And the whole idea again, is try to find your SS table on disk. So whenever you ask for a row key, it has to go find it on the disk somewhere. Bloom filters are applied to row data, and, or to SS tables, and what the, it's kind of a reverse. It says, it asks, is it there? And it says, it's absolutely not here. That's what it will tell you. The, the probabilistic part is that it, it could come back saying, it might be here. We're trying to reduce that, so that would be a false positive. So um, the Bloom filters is going to eliminate a lot of SS tables right off the bat. So whenever you, when you have to go to look to the disk, it'll look at all the Bloom filters for every SS table. Are you there? 
and then they'll say no, 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 maybe. <laughs> and you might get like three or four maybes, so you can go look at three or four files instead of a thousand. Um, the tighter that bloom filter is, the less maybes you get, and you're just getting to your disk or to your data faster. Um, resources for that, uh, just Google bloom filter Cassandra. There's a couple of great tech blog articles about how we manage bloom filters. Um, the Wikipedia has a great write-up on bloom filters, and actually I saw an animated bloom filter demonstration, which is pretty interesting. It's a very interesting data structure. Uh, Michael asks, many of the commandments are oriented towards spinning disk. Can you elaborate on performance with SSD? Or maybe there are a couple of commandments for SSDs that you can think of. Uh, I, I could come up with so many more commandments. You know, just trying to keep it limited. Uh, so, yes, I, I oriented a lot of that towards spinning disk because spinning disk can be a a problem if managed incorrectly. Uh, I like to say that when you use SSDs, you eliminate a lot of problems. Just, they just take those problems out of the mix because things like um, latency and throughput are just in a different class. Um, the average latency on a SSD is in microseconds, not milliseconds, completely different order uh, magnitude. Now, a commandment that I would throw at you for SSDs is tune your operating system. I have been at several places where people were just so angry because their SSDs were slower than their spinning disk. And the reason was is because the operating system was not tuned properly. What, what kind of tuning? Um, there is actually a setting in, the, uh, in on, on your system uh, in the scheduler It says rotational, and it's always on. You're not using a rotational disk. Turn it off. Um, things like your scheduler itself. Um, they, you ship default with CFQ, completely fair cure. Uh, you probably want to look at using deadline or no op because you're just not having to, you, you don't need to be fair. you got tons of bandwidth, go for it. And I've seen just in changing from CFQ to deadline or no op, the night and day difference in how your SSDs work. So there's a commandment for you, thou shalt tune thy iOS with SSDs. So Patrick, as always, you know, many, many more questions than we have time for. Let, let's get one more from Steve. Do you recommend using EBS volumes in AWS or does this violate a commandment? What setup would you recommend for AWS and can you point to some resources? I am showing, can you, am I sharing my screen right now? Never use shared storage. There you go. You just violated commandment number eight. EBS is definitely shared storage. Definitely not recommended. Um, I personally have had a creator in my deployment <laughs> before I worked at Datastax. I, I ran production, Cassandra, and I thought, hey, EBS looks really cool. You know, it's provisioned. I use provisioned IOPS because that looks, you know, it's, it's not just regular EBS. It's better EBS, right? No. It, the latency on EBS is really bad. It will make your Cassandra installation so bad. Um, use ephemeral disks, be happy, move on with your life, it'll be better. That was a great so, ending. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you to our friends in Vancouver at NetApp. Can we have a loud cheer or jeer for Mr. McFadden? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> wow. You should you should take them all to what time is it there? One one o'clock? I, I think that's fair enough. You should take them all to the pub right now for uh getting through that with you. Uh really Um as as Patrick said at the beginning, please join us for our next uh Cassandra webinar, which is the day before Valentine's Day, February thirteenth. Cassandra Beyond Read, Modify, Write. That is by Al Toby, who is on the evangelist team as well, has a ton of experience uh, running very large Cassandra clusters in production. So please meet us back here on February 13th for Cassandra Beyond Read, Modify, Write. Patrick, thank you again. Really appreciate it. Oh, I thank you very much to the NetApp crew. This is awesome. This is probably my favorite webinar so far. <laughs> By the way, if you um, 
We had some newbies on the line today. This is a fantastic resource. The free online training um, Java development with Apache Cassandra. Uh, it's a seven week course. There's an exam at the end, get you certified on it. Um, the link is on your screen now. Not on my screen. <laughs> okay, this is San Francisco out. All right. Yeah.